Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter This episode was recorded before Joel Schumacher passed away in June of 2020. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hi, everybody. And we are being joined by a very special guest. Everyone, please welcome my co-host on Greystoke and Thundar Road, Michael May. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Thank you. We're doing good. Hey, Michael, you want to tell everyone who you are, what you do, where they can find you? I am a writer and podcaster. My most accessible writing is a graphic novel I wrote called Kill All Monsters, which is available everywhere with artist Jason Copeland. It's a kaiju giant robots slam fast, but hopefully with an actual story in there somewhere. <laughs> it's very good. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and my website is michaelmay.online, which will link to all of my podcasts, including the ones that Noel mentioned, Grace Stoked and Thundar Road that we do together. We are here to discuss the 1996 film, A Time to Kill, directed by Joel Schumacher. Michael, in general, what is your experience with the films of Joel Schumacher, and do you have any opinions on the man as a filmmaker? I do. For a time, he was one of my favorite directors, and he's still, I think, a very interesting director. I discovered him on The Lost Boys. I saw that in the theaters mm-hmm. when it came out. I saw it about a billion times in the theaters. <laughs> I kept dragging people back to it. I just fell in love with that movie and became a Kiefer Sutherland fan out of it. And then I started looking back at his career from there and realized he had done DC Cab and St. Almost Fire, which I also enjoyed to varying levels. Mm-hmm. Followed him mm-hmm. to Flatliners, enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> became immediately disenchanted by Dying Young. <laughs> that was not my <laughs> cup of tea. To be fair, there were reasons. Yeah. <laughs> For that reason, I skipped Falling Down, which was probably a mistake. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I got curious about him again in The Client because, you know, Mm. he was like this director who I really used to like and he's doing John Grisham, who I also really enjoyed. I enjoyed Batman Forever. And then with this film, The Time to Kill, he was fully back on my radar until Batman and Robin, (laughs) where he fell back off again. Although my feelings on that movie have changed dramatically in recent years. I quite like it now. So he's always been somebody that I've kept an eye on and followed. I think there's movies of his that are in my top 10 movies of all time. Mm. And this is one of them. (laughs) Nice. Of course, as you mentioned, this is based on a novel by John Grisham. This was John Grisham's first novel written in 1989 Hmm. after he spent a decade as a trial attorney and even in the House of Representatives in Mississippi. Okay. This novel was only published with a 5,000 print hardcover release. It was a very small, modest indie publisher that released it. And it wasn't until his second novel, The Firm, became this massive bestseller that A Time to Kill was finally issued in paperback and also became a big success. Mm. And this was the fourth in a run of successful John Grisham film adaptations following The Firm, The Pelican Brief, and The Client. And A Time to Kill is also Grisham's first film as a producer. Mm. Okay. And Michael, you mentioned that you enjoyed Grisham. What's your history with the works of John Grisham? I have not read a single... No, actually, I take that back. I tried to read that (laughs) Christmas book. Christmas with the Cranks? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, somebody gave that to me and it wasn't my thing. (laughs) But I've never read any of his legal novels, which is interesting because I love the movies that are based Mm -hmm. on them. All Mm -hmm. the previous ones that came before Time to Kill, I was a huge fan of all those films. Maybe The Client a little bit less so, but I don't think that was Schumacher's fault. It it was a little bit different. It wasn't like Mm -hmm. somebody running around being chased all the time. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I had friends who did read his stuff, including my dad, and they all said that A Time to Kill was their favorite novel of his. And so when this Mm -hmm. came out, there are many reasons why I was excited about it in the first place. Some of the actors are some of my favorite people too, but certainly I was looking forward to it. I did read the novel for this. It is a pretty faithful adaptation. I do want to recommend to you, Michael, as someone whose first Grisham novel was Christmas with the Cranks, (laughs) which I believe was Skipping Christmas at the time. That's right. Mm -hmm. Having now read The Client and A Time to Kill, I think you would really love the lushness of his world building. I need to. I need to do it. I really think they'd be right up your alley. Cool. So yes, the screenplay was again written by Akiva Goldsman. Mm -hmm. I will go on record as saying he wrote a good script. Okay. I have issues with it. I have my quibbles. (laughs) It has its Goldsmanisms, but we'll get into them. Right. (laughs) They're not hugely overwhelming. (laughs) 
we've had our say on Akiva Goldsman on the last yeah. two episodes because this is, again, over halfway through a four-film streak where he worked with Joel <laughs> Schumacher. This is my third Akiva Goldsman screenplay that I've had to read. You're being very kind. I am. <laughs> this is a film where he deserved that kindness. I'm proud of you. For the most part. I have my issues. We'll get there. So yeah, otherwise, I don't really have any other production notes. Uh, are you ready if I just hop into the synopsis? Sure. In Canton, Mississippi, Tanya Haley, a 10-year-old black girl, is abducted by two white men who beat, rape, and attempt to kill her before throwing her off a bridge. She survives and is returned to her family in the arms of her distraught father, Carl Lee Haley. The men are quickly taken into custody, with one even signing a confession, but with them likely to only do 10 years for such a heinous crime, Carl Lee visits Jake Brigance, a young white attorney who helped the Haley family on a past case, and asks if he would defend Carl Lee if something were to happen. Thinking of his own daughter, Jake agrees. The day of the preliminary hearing, as the two men are led into court, Carl Lee bursts out of the closet with a machine gun and mows them down before the crowd. He quietly turns himself in, expecting to be let off due to the nature of the case, but Jake tells him it isn't that easy, and is further complicated by a deputy being struck by one of those bullets and needing to have his leg amputated, and seemingly cemented when they end up with an all-white jury. As the trial sets in motion, it draws in Rufus Buckley, the righteous district attorney, hoping this punch against vigilantism will further his aspirations to run for governor. Carl Lee's involvement draws in the NAACP and protest marches led by the local preachers, whom Carl Lee challenges when they lock away money raised in his name and try to replace his lawyer with their own. Many whites of the town, rallied by Freddie Lee Cobb, the brother of one of the slain rapists, invite in the Ku Klux Klan, who initiate new members and start a campaign of hate and harassment that only gets worse when their leader is engulfed by a Molotov cocktail. Jake was eager for the publicity of this case, but didn't expect the phone calls and crosses burned on his lawn, leading his wife and daughter to flee the state. As his house is burned down, a National Guardsman takes a bullet to the neck meant for Jake, his elderly secretary is attacked, which leads to her husband's death, and the racial strife breaks into an all-out bloody battle on the street outside the courthouse, Jake keeps fighting for Carl Lee. With the help of a sleazy divorce lawyer, his drunk aging mentor, and a plucky young legal clerk the film wants to tease a relationship with before she's captured and assaulted by the Klan. After both sides manage to discredit each other's psychiatrist in Jake's plea that Carl Lee be found innocent on grounds of insanity, and the prosecution's chief witness, the deputy who lost a leg, ends up arguing in support of Carl Lee, the time comes for the final statements, as, with Carl Lee's urging, Jake holds a mirror to the racism of the all-white jury by asking them to imagine the rape as he describes it in detail, ending with asking them to imagine if the girl was white. Cut to the courtroom door slamming open as cries of innocent fill the air. The Klan is angrily deflated, with Freddie Lee Cobb and his cohorts taken into custody. Carl Lee returns home with his family, and when his neighbors throw a big country picnic, Jake and his family join, hoping the two men's daughters can now play together. So, Angie. Yes. <laughs> had you ever seen this film before, and, and do you recommend it now? I had. I probably didn't see it until it was on television, because I don't remember going to the theater for it, but it's definitely mm -hmm. one that I saw multiple times before. I do recommend it. I have quibbles here and there, but I think it's a pretty solid courtroom drama overall. And it's one of those that you can definitely get a whole lot of moral discussions out of, which I really enjoy for that reason. And I'm sure we'll get into. Oh, yeah. Michael, you've already gotten into your history on the film, but do you still recommend it? Absolutely, I do. I think there are times when I look at it a little more cynically than other times. This last <laughs> time that I watched it, my cynical glasses were somewhere else <laughs> in the other room because I just ate it up. So I'm fully on board with it this time. I usually go between out of five stars, like four and a half of five stars. I'm full on five stars right now. Mm. Yeah, I had never seen this film before. This was that period where I watched a bunch of the Grisha movies. Like I had seen The Client. I'd seen The Pelican Brief. I saw The Chamber. But I never mm. saw The Firm and I never saw this. So this was my first time seeing it. Again, I read the book. I recommend it. I do. I think it's a very strong film. Most of my quibbles are just due to my familiarity with the writing of Akiva Goldsman and the specific things that he does <laughs> that bother me. And they're so minor here because it is a very strong adaptation of the book and it was a really strong book. It's a good story. It's a good mix of characters and concepts and themes. And I got to say, Joel's direction, he directs the hell out of it. And this definitely is a film from the same guy who directed Flatliners and Falling Down. It's got that same heat, that same way of exploring the microcosm of the world, very stylistic without being overly stylistic. Mm -hmm. And God, the cast is just a great cast yeah. of actors just all bringing their A game. So yeah, I do recommend it. Let's see, where to even start on this one? Should we also get the disclaimer out of the way with Kevin Spacey in this movie? <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> the good thing is he's the villain, at least, yes. so you're not supposed to like him. That helps. <laughs> the disclaimer is this is going to be our first Joel Schumacher one where we encounter Kevin Spacey. It's probably going to be a lot harder when we get to House of Cards. Right, yeah. I can't remember if there's anything in between those two. I don't think so. I don't know. But yeah, it's Kevin Spacey. We'll save that discussion until we get to his character, but at okay. least he's playing an <laughs> asshole that we're not supposed to like. Right. That helps. Yeah. So why don't we start with... So, Michael, is he guilty or not? (laughs) Softball. (laughs) He's not guilty. Yeah. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what makes it so interesting, right? Like, legally, he's totally guilty. He committed murder. He planned it out. Really, Jake should be excusing himself from this case altogether because he knew about it ahead of time. But on the other hand, do you blame him? Exactly. He doesn't deserve a life sentence or the chair. You know, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean, they're not only trying his case. They're also trying the case that never went to trial. Yeah. About what should have happened to those guys. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things I love about the story. That's one of the things that I I like so much about this setup is it's about the complicated clash between laws and morality. Mm -hmm. By the law, yes, he killed two men in cold blood. He brought a loaded machine gun into a public courthouse, (laughs) unloaded it, even maimed a deputy. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) his reasons were ridiculously valid, you know? Right. (laughs) And it is one of those complicated cases where it's like... Damned if you do, damned if you don't, because it's like on some mm-hmm. level he should have some consequence for his action, but you also don't want right. to punish a dad who did that. <laughs> and that's what I like about this film is, you know, we have so many films where it's like they raise a question, but they don't want to have an answer. But they forget that, you know, you still need to set multiple answers in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. When you're having a philosophical debate, you still need to bring up the various sides of an argument. And I think this film does a very good job of doing that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it's trying to have its cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. Right. Michael, any other thoughts on that broader legal case or or how they play it out in the film? I have specific thoughts, beats, and scenes that they hit Mm -hmm. along the way, but I've never had a discussion with somebody who took the opposite point of view from me (laughs) that he deserved to die. I don't believe he deserved the gas chamber. I thought the 10 years of manslaughter would have been fair. Yeah. Right. Something like that. Yeah. But that was kind of off the table. That was not something that the DA was offering. Right. It was kind of always in the back of Jake's mind. Well, maybe we can plead for that, but it was never something that was real. So I guess I've never had the opportunity to really put into words, try to defend my position, because it seems like that's the position that most viewers take with it. I think the best way to describe it is, and this kind of goes to what we've seen opinions in broader social culture become, is it's a very complex thing that deserves a very nuanced and measured response, but it ends up blowing up into the extremisms of right, wrong, Mm -hmm. good, bad, Mm -hmm. and neither side wants to meet in the middle. Right. Yeah. It's so juicy of a setup, and I think this does a very good job of letting it play out. And even just getting into the whole things of wanting to move the case to a different area where we would at least get a black person on the jury. Right. Right. And being stuck with an all white jury and getting into the complications of who would sympathize with a vigilante and who wouldn't. And Mm -hmm. even just kind of openly acknowledging that, yeah, we don't believe he was actually insane. We just want to use insanity because that's our only out that the jury could use to let him off. Yeah. 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 I get really invested in what's going to happen to Carly in this movie. The legal maneuverings are not the part that really pull me through it. (laughs) Right. It's a lot of the conversations that happen around it. Yeah. I am sure that. The presentation of the legal proceedings is, if I was a lawyer, I would probably have a harder time with the film than I do. But I've been on a jury. I've been on a pretty dramatic court case. Mm. So there are points where I go, okay, that's probably not accurate to what would really happen. But certainly Grisham knows his stuff. He knows what he's doing. And I think the film is much less egregious than a lot of other ones that I've seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a few bits where they shorthanded what was in the book. Right. Sure. There's a lot more focus on the jury in the book. Mm. I was just thinking that because, you know, we get the two scenes in the restaurant yeah and you could tell that one guy who initially thought he was not guilty was feeling super pressured and he was like well i may as well just go along with this even in the second vote he's very reluctantly raising his hand there's a cut scene that was even in the script where he goes uh-huh. out to get ice and is attacked by clansman oh uh, okay really wow yeah wow i do think that is very interesting because a jury has to be unanimous the sort of peer pressure that can happen and i think it would have been interesting to maybe explore that a little bit more. Yeah. Especially because they were also convinced he was guilty. I mean, obviously his speech at the end changes their mind, but 
you do see him crying. I guess it's not, maybe, you know, maybe we do get to see more of it. You don't have to have them spell it out for you. In the script, he literally pulled out a picture of his daughter and was looking at it while he was giving the speech. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, okay. He toned that down a little bit. There's another version of this story where it would have been all focused on the jury. And I'm glad yeah. that they didn't do it that way. Like, mm-hmm. we don't even get the scene. And I love this, that we don't get the scene of the foreman of the jury declaring the verdict. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just outside. And then the kid runs out and shouts yeah. it out. Yeah. Those two scenes with the jury are really only there to kind of raise the tension for us. Is like, yeah. oh, crap, this isn't going well. Mm-hmm. And then that's really all they're supposed to be doing. Sure. I should also point out, the book is 600 pages long. Mm-hmm. So it was dense. Sure. So it covered it from broader angles. Like, I'd love to see, like, a good 10-episode miniseries based on that book. Yeah. I mean, Akiva Goldsman in general doesn't always put the best character definitions on things, but I just got the feeling. I'm like, there's more to this in the book. I guarantee, like, different Mm -hmm. scenes that would happen. I'm like, there's more to this, but he's summing it up as quickly as he can to keep the movie moving forward. Exactly. To get into one of them, because we're on the jury, I might as well. In the movie, there's that whole bit where Buckley is doing the press conference where he's talking about the sealed list of jurors while he's looking at one of Mm. his partners who's winking as he holds (laughs) up the list of jurors. Yeah, I mean, I literally said, yeah, right. (laughs) That is the type of Akiva Goldsman shorthand that kind of grates on me. Mm -hmm. And also that every character is introduced by, here's their name and a quick bullet point of who they are and what they do. (laughs) Yeah. Like, the dialogue is so on the nose on everything. It's like, I just want to, like, X out lines and just let the scenes play without them. (laughs) But, I mean, again, that's not egregious. A lot of the scenes here are pretty close to what was written in the book. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like, the whole selection of the jury, it's like both Jake and Buckley do get their hands on the list. List, an entire chunk of the book is just them researching the jurors and mm. finding out, mm. I want this person, I don't want this person, I want this person, I don't want this person, by both sides illegally mm. investigating the lives of these people. And that's actually where the divorce yeah. attorney comes into the story in the book, the Oliver Platt character. Jake goes to him and says, have you ever run any divorces on these people? Who are they? What are they like? Mm. Mm. They somewhat okay. boosted that character up into kind of a sidekick character when he wasn't in the book. He just kind of popped in and out of the book. Gotcha. Because Jake knows all the diners around town. He'll go up to the diners and the head chef and go like, hey, are any of these guys regulars? What are they like? Mm. Mm-hmm. Like, he'll even go to the local black diner and say, can you tell me which of these people are black so I know which ones to focus on? Mm. It's this whole process of how juries are selected. Sure. I mean, yeah, that's how you win or lose a lot of times. Sure. Exactly. And then that was all leading up to the scene where him and Buckley have 12 exceptions each where they can, like, knock people off on the jury. And it's just, mm-hmm. you, you remember that old game where it's like you put all the checker pieces in the board and you would, like, pull out the slots to let the lines drop down? Connect four? Is that- yeah, kind of like Connect four, where it's like you're just waiting to see what it's all going to drop down to, what the juries you're going to get. Mm. And then there was more on the jury again, like the changing opinions. And the biggest thing in the book, there was such this big worry about getting middle-aged women on the jury. And Mm -hmm. it ends up being a middle-aged woman on the jury who tells the other jurors, you know, I thought of something. I want you to close your eyes and picture this. And she's the one who gives that speech to the other jurors that causes them to vote innocent. Really? Jake had that speech about the truth. But then that final Mm -hmm. bit there was one of the jurors who they dismissed, ending up being the one who sways Mm -hmm. the entire jury. Okay. I understand in a two and a half hour movie they have already got so much going on they had to cut it but that was such a point in the book Mm -hmm. again i would love to see this story readapted in a much longer format but still i think the movie still works Mm -hmm. anyways michael you were talking about how much you were invested in the journey of carly haley you want to go talk about sam jackson the character of carly yeah man uh so this movie came out after Pulp Fiction, after Die Hard with the Vengeance. Mm-hmm. So I knew Samuel L. Jackson. But even just watching this again this week, every time I watch this, I'm amazed by his performance in it. And Samuel L. Jackson, he's so charismatic. He's so charming. Everything he's in, he's just completely watchable just because of his mm-hmm. presence, right? But he acts the hell out of this part. And the movie, it lives and dies by his ability to communicate to me what he's thinking, especially in these conversations with Jake. Mm -hmm. I love when they corner him on the stand and get him to say what he really thinks about the guys (laughs) that he killed. But that whole we ain't friends speech just rips me up because I'm Jake in that scene, right? (laughs) Yeah. And when he says, you're one of the bad guys, like I feel that. And one of the things that I love about this movie and even the whole now imagine she's white thing is it really holds a mirror up to me and makes me 
face a lot of my own unconscious prejudices. And I love the speech where he says, you know, you're one of the bad guys. You don't mean to be, but you are, you know, and I'm not completely 100% Jake, but I, <laughs> I feel <laughs> challenged by that in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. And Samuel Jackson, something in his performance, I mean, he's desperate, but it's not just that. It's sad. Mm -hmm. It is. There's a sadness to it. Yeah. He's not defeated, but he's like... He's tired. Yeah. Thank you. And he just communicates that all the way through. I love his character. I love how he saves himself. I love how he handles the NAACP and they're wanting to like bring yeah. in different lawyers. And I love Carly saying, you know, that's why I picked you. <laughs> it's like, yeah. that's why I defended you against these guys is because I need you to do this particular thing. He's the main character as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Jake is the one who kind of learns something through it all. Yeah. But Carly is the most active character, I think, in the movie. We tend to think of Samuel Jackson, he gets the roles a lot of the angry guy with an attitude, and he does it incredibly well, so we're happy to see it. But this kind of movie does really remind you of how much range he truly has as an actor and like how he can do the sad and so many different things. And he's the highlight, absolutely. Matthew McConaughey is great too, but Samuel Jackson is definitely the strongest performer in this movie. And I agree that last scene at the end is just absolutely fantastic. I think you need that scene in this movie more than you need Imagine She's White. I think that's the scene that really drives the racial divide home. Mm. And here's where I'm going to say something very complimentary. Akiva Goldsman wrote that scene. It wasn't in the book. Really? Okay. Wow. Good. Maybe Joel had a hand in it too. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe Samuel Jackson might have informed yeah. it too. You know, you never know. Well, I think it was because they decided to give that speech to Jake. They needed to give the motivation to have him give that speech. And I think they did a very good job. One thing that kind of bothers me about Goldsman is he'll often fall into a lot of shortcuts for how characters get motivated, like the whole thing where a character doesn't know the answer and someone comes in and tells a completely unrelated story and the lead character will go like, mm. that's it, you're a genius. And the other person's <laughs> yeah. sitting there like, wait, what did I say? He does that scene a lot. Mm. Thankfully, mm -hmm. this was a much better, deeper, richer, thematically driven way of doing that. Yeah. And I will absolutely give him credit for that. And yeah, Carl Lee... This is where I would actually argue in favor of the insanity plea because he's not fully thinking of the consequences of all he does is wants to be there for his daughter and with his daughter and with his family. Right. And by taking these actions, you are literally removing yourself from your ability to do that. Yep. Is being there and helping and supporting your daughter more important than gunning down two guys who are already in custody? Right. You want to gun them down 10 years later when they get off. Yeah. That's a bit of a different story. But what I like is that, yeah, he's so caught in the moment that he's not thinking of the emotional consequences of his actions. And I don't mean legal. I mean, just you're not going to be able to be with your daughter if you take these actions against the people who did that to her. Right, right. In a time when you need to be with your daughter. And then I think he's getting so desperate over, I need you to get me off so I can go home and be with my family. Mm -hmm. But it's getting him off of a situation that he put himself into. Right. At the end of the day, there was no necessity for him to do what he did. No, no. I understand the drive for it. I sympathize with the drive for it, but there was no necessity for it. Exactly. That's where I kind of fall down onto it's a very nuanced thing where there should be some level of consequence, but he doesn't deserve the gas chamber. No, absolutely not. And I like how that is affecting the character. It's interesting how they play the guilt where it's like he doesn't feel guilty for the actions that he took, but he feels guilty for the situation he's put himself in. Right. Yeah. Which usually that's a big turnoff <laughs> for me, <laughs> you know, just as a parent. It's like you want people to feel bad about what they did, not the fact that they got caught doing it. Right. That is one of the things I like about this movie is he goes to Jake yeah. the night before and he says, if I was in a jam, would you help me out? Like he knows full well he's working oh, yeah. it and he's playing it the whole time. But he also knows what kind of world he lives in. And he knows yeah. that if there's going to be any justice for what these guys did to his daughter, then it's up to him to carry it out. And just from a practical level, like, was it necessary? Like, I don't know. But emotionally, yeah. it certainly was. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm going to say, I think they wrote it well. I think they directed mm -hmm. it well. And I think he plays it beautifully. Yeah. yeah. So one of the other major features of this film is it's a very sweaty movie. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ashley Judd is Ashley like covered Judd. in water. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. <laughs> This movie glistens like a saxophonist in a Joel <laughs> Schumacher movie. <laughs> it is definitely capturing the heat of summer in the South. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, this is areas where these people only have window units instead of central air, I guess. It's a smaller, poorer community. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some fans. Well, you have to remember the book was set in the long distant time of 1984. 
We had central air in 84 in the New Orleans area. I was being facetious. <laughs> but I will say that smaller towns around here, you can still go to certain areas yeah. and they still don't have central air just because of how old the house is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and especially like old buildings like the courtroom. And mm-hmm. a lot of this movie is set outside, too. Yeah. Where it would probably be pretty sweltering. <laughs> I love that atmosphere that he captured here. Like, I love, we mentioned that in Falling Down was how well Joel captures the heat. Mm-hmm. Not only with that, but he's not going overboard with saturating the colors, but he's still giving it a warmth yeah. that brings off that heat. Mm-hmm. Angie, what would you think about Matthew McConaughey as Jake Brigance? You know, as we were saying, like, since Carl Lee is kind of really the main character, Jake, he's certainly got a motive, but everything's happening around him more than him being a full-blown character all the time. Yeah. I do think it is interesting to watch him go from, oh, this is finally going to get me some business and make my career, to, oh, wait, this is actually about a real issue. And I think he slowly starts to wake up to what's yeah. going on. Not to say that he wasn't sympathetic to begin with, obviously, since Carly came to him and told him he was going to do it and he let him do it. But once again, that's nuance here, right? There's a lot of nuances going on. But Matthew McConaughey's performance certainly is very, very good. And I enjoy watching him play it out. Love him. He is the character that goes on a journey. And in that sense, he is the antagonist of the film. Even though, like I said earlier, Samuel Jackson's character is the one who really is driving everything. Like He's the one who's oddly in control. McConaughey, I grew up in the South. I am very sensitive to the way Southerners are portrayed, and I'm very cued in the way lawyers are when they watch lawyer movies. I'm cued in to <laughs> accents and how well they're mm-hmm. being done. And anytime you've got an actual Southern actor using their real accent, it just makes my heart swell and just, <laughs> I feel all warm inside. And I love that about McConaughey. And this was the first movie I'd ever seen him in. So it just felt very genuine just having him as the lead actor. And he's so good. And I don't know if we want to get into it now or when we talk about Ellen Roark, but I really like their relationship and I like his relationship with his wife. I love how the film handles both of those relationships and putting them against each other in a way. Yeah, McConaughey is just so full of charm and this movie made me a fan of his. I think he does a great job of, again, bringing out the flashy cockiness of the character Mm -hmm. while also Mm -hmm. the... I didn't fully understand the consequences of this choice. Yeah. The whole scene where he's in the rubble of his burnt down house, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. calling for the dog. Oh my gosh, just rips me up, yeah. In the book, the dog died. Mm. And again, that's a scene written by Akiva Goldsman. That's not a scene from the book. Okay. So, and I I gotta give it to him. And the way he's playing it is beautiful. It's so heart-wrenching that, again, it's like, I just wanted to do the right thing and maybe get some extra customers out of it. And the entire world is trying to burn me down. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Again, it's a very nuanced character. There's a lot of nuance in this movie. Yeah. Honestly, that's where my issues with Goldsman clash in that Goldsman is a little on the nose of writers, so he doesn't always do nuance well, but I think they're kind of reining mm-hmm. it in well enough that you're still getting a lot of that complexity to the emotions of the people who are caught in the middle of this broader social argument. And he sells the hell out of that oh summation speech, man. Yeah. yeah. I tense up and just clench up <laughs> as he's making that speech. It's so powerful. God, yeah. Just that moment where he breaks down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's impressive that I know it was a huge gamble for McConaughey in this. This is his first lead role. Oh, okay. Right. He had only started acting in movies three years before this and wow. had only done supporting roles, the most popular, which was Dazed and Confused. Oh, yeah. Where he's, you know, the, all right, all right, all right. Which is very different. He became yeah. the stereotypical McConaughey in his first major supporting (laughs) role. And then was also the villain in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 4. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) Like, he was in Angels in the Outfield. He was in Operation Dumbo Drop. But he was part of the ensemble. Yeah. Mm. And then this was his first major film. And it was a big gamble. And and I thought it paid off really well. And, of course, he took off right after this. Right. Yeah. So let's go ahead and bring in Sandra Bullock as Ellen Rourke. This was just right in the middle of my complete infatuation with Sandra Bullock, the world's infatuation with Sandra Bullock. Like she was <laughs> completely on top. And she was so smart in her career too. Like she would make like an action thriller movie and then a romantic comedy, and then an action thriller and a romantic comedy. And she did Speed. That's where me and then the rest of the world kind well, I, of- I just looked it up. Speed, While You Were Sleeping, and The Net were all one, two, three, back to back. Yeah. Mm. Uh-huh. And then she did Two If by Sea with Dennis Leary, which was a smaller film, but it was also kind of a romantic comedy. Yeah. And then this followed that. So she was still kind of following that pattern. 
I love her and I love her like why you're sleeping one of my favorite romantic comedies of all time and she's just got such a genuineness to her I mm-hmm. remember being kind of frustrated with how small her role is or how little Ellen Roark actually affects things in this I mean she does affect things she's mm-hmm. an important character she is a top build character because it was Sandra Bullock but her character isn't on the same level as Matthew McConaughey and Samuel L. Jackson I was a little bit irritated by that at the time, but now that I've had some time to kind of mellow with it, I enjoy Ellen. I enjoy what she brings to this Northern liberal perspective that she adds to all of this, Mm -hmm. this contrast for the rest of this world to be compared to. I really like the way that her and Jake's relationship develops or really doesn't develop. Like there's clearly this attraction there and his wife is out of town because they're fighting. There are so many scenes where I thought this was going to head down somewhere I really didn't want it to head. Do you want me to stay? Yes, that's why you should go. Mm. I love that line. I love that line. And there was another one just a little bit earlier than that, too. He's a good person (laughs) and he's committed to his wife. And that's so rare. I was so prepared for them to add this adultery element to give him some feet of clay or something. He's already got feet of clay. He didn't need that. I just love that they let him hold on to the integrity of his relationship with his wife. It's interesting because I agree and disagree with you. Um, I do really like her as a character a lot. It's funny when I first learned about Sandra Bullock through Speed, and I really didn't like her in that movie, but I think it was probably a lot of jealousy over the fact that she got to kiss Keanu Reeves. (laughs) (laughs) Fair. But no, if I had seen her in this first, I think I would have absolutely loved her as I eventually did come to in time. But to me, while I do appreciate that they don't go there with the adultery, I'd like it better if you just didn't have that element to it at all. Like, just because she's a woman, you don't have to have this whole flirtatious Mm -hmm. thing. Just have her be there, have her be a smart law student, have her open his eyes with the liberal stuff. You can even leave in the comments of like, we're coming to these cafes because you don't want people to see us together because they're in a small southern town and people are going to talk. Right. That makes perfect sense. To me, I'm just like, leave the whole flirting bit out of it. I don't even need that part of it. I don't need romantic tension. There's enough tension going on in this movie that I didn't need that element. Yeah, and that's what the book is. In the book, it's much more of a platonic friendship. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Again, the reasons are I don't want to go to a restaurant with you because I don't want people to think I'm cheating on my wife. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it is very platonic. They just really energize each other on a legal level in terms of she researches everything. He gives her the focus to the research and she gives him the results of the research. Mm -hmm. They really drive that angle of it. The one scene that I don't like in the script is... In order to discredit this professor, I'm going to sneak into his office and rifle through his notes. <laughs> That's not from the book. In the book, it's just she researches the hell out of it and comes up with all that data. Mm. The only important thing is that her finding that data and her data being what takes that doctor down, you don't need the whole her sneaking into the office. <laughs> That's the type of shorthand that I don't like. Mm-hmm. It's a writing shortcut, and it's not a good one, and it distracts from the actual results of what you're trying to achieve. Especially the whole, like, I have to ask some questions, Your Honor, but can we just wait one more minute? <laughs> it's like, well, is she going to show up? Right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like, that's unneeded drama. That's cheap drama. (laughs) I'm kind of of two minds. On the one hand, I like exploring a mutual attraction where they are mutually, genuinely attracted to each other, but Mm -hmm. they have reasons why they're not acting on that. Right. Sure. They still are able to bond while still having that attraction that they're not acting on. But on the other, it would be nice to have more stories explore platonic relationships. Right. In general. Yeah. That doesn't mean every exploration of a non-platonic relationship is a bad one. No, no. It's just, it'd be refreshing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think (laughs) when this movie came out, I think that was absolutely a true statement. Like, there were not a lot of platonic relationships in the 90s or before. Mm -hmm. I think since then, we've had a bunch of them, and I think it's great. If they had just had this be a platonic relationship, I wouldn't have gone, hey, why aren't they kissing? (laughs) But what I never see in film, and, and I'm glad that I get to see in this one, is this exploration of, you know what, I'm really attracted to this person, but I, for reasons, cannot let it go anywhere. We're going to show you resisting. We're going to show you someone saying, Mm -hmm. no, I'm not going to do this thing that I shouldn't be doing. Well, and that they're both not going to do this thing that they both want to do and they both know each other once. Yes. Right. It is refreshing to see that instead of whereas a lot of other movies would have just had them act on it and 
oops. Right, right. Exactly. Just another example of it is, you don't want to kiss me right now, right? And he does. He kisses her very chastely on, on the, the forehead. forehead. Yeah. yeah, On the forehead. And it's a kiss goodbye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's also a nice scene is with her in the hospital was not in the book. Mm. Again, it's like there are a chunk of scenes here that are original to the script, which I will credit Goldsman to and say that they were good additions. Mm. That was one of the frustrating things about the book is that after her attack by the clan, where they also took a knife and cut off all of her hair. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. You actually never see her again in the book. You just get this brief thing about how after spending a day in the hospital, she flew away for recovery hmm. with her father. And you never get this goodbye between her and Jake. But again, you also don't yeah. have that romantic tension with her and Jake. Right. 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 It is one of the shortcomings of the book that she actually doesn't come into the book until about halfway through. Hmm. The okay. trial has already become this national media sensation. And then that's what she flies in and tries to become a part of it. A lot of the stuff that happens in the movie is what happens in the book. A lot of the, like, their meetings, their discussions, her research and everything like that. And then she's attacked by the clan, and then she just is gone. I like that the film brought her in earlier, allowed her story to be more a part of the broader story, mm -hmm. and I like that they gave her that ending. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you really needed the attack by the clan. I'm glad they didn't go further with it than they did. Right. Mm -hmm. Even in the book, it's like they strip her naked, cut her a bunch of times, and then cut her hair off. At one mm -hmm. point, someone pulls out a bullwhip that they decide not to go that far. Okay. It's one of those things where it's like, I don't know that you needed to put her in that position. But I think they still executed it well. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the romantic tension, if you're going to have this sweaty sensuality to everything, Joel Schumacher's not a bad person to give it to. <laughs> yeah. The non-romance in this was better than all of the romance in Dying Young. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> That's not saying much, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think there was a single saxophone in this movie, though. That's the unfortunate thing. No, it wouldn't really fit with the theme and the mood. <laughs> what, they don't have saxophones in the South? Well, they do, <laughs> but I mean, if you're not playing blues or jazz, then no, you don't want this one. <laughs> I just want a shirtless, oiled-up guy coming out on a stage with a harmonica then. Yes. <laughs> the same guy from Lost Boys. Yes. Give him a harmonica now. <laughs> oh, seriously, just give him a cameo in every Joel Schumacher movie where he has a different instrument. Or he's playing the washboards, but instead it's his abs. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just want to see which film he would just come out, stand there, and just give one little blow on a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> Dying Young 2. <laughs> and then just start gyrating. Mm -mm. That would have fit in Batman and Robin, actually. Yep. I'm shocked he wasn't in Batman and Robin. <laughs> Anyways, let's go ahead and rip that Band-Aid off. Angie, Kevin Spacey. Uh, you know, it's just the moment his name popped up in the credits, I'm like, oh, goody. Okay. All right. This I think this is my first film I've watched ever since the allegations became public. Yeah. But like I said, he's the villain, so that helps. I've always thought he's a really good actor, so I can't deny that. He plays this kind of grandstanding Southern politician very well. I like the cuts to his face that we get while Jake is giving his big speech at the end, where you can see, like, he's angry, but he's also... Because we get to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he's also, like, yeah. saying, like, yeah, this kid's doing a really good job, yeah. and he's got me. He's got me. He does do a really good job with expressing that, even if I hate giving him a compliment right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's tough to separate the actor from the part. It helps me some that, I mean, I was a big Kevin Spacey fan in the 90s, mm -hmm. and this movie came right after The Usual Suspects and right after Seven. And so when I watch him in this, it's pretty easy to put myself back in the mindset of me watching it when the movie originally came out. And he mm -hmm. does do a good job. And just him aside, I like the character. I like that the character is not completely villainous the way that John Voight is in Rainmaker. As you were saying earlier, Noel, like there's a sense in which he's right. It's nuanced, yeah. <laughs> His argument right. is that this guy murdered these people in front of all these witnesses and has admitted to it. And I'm having him admit it again on the stand. And he's not wrong. The DA is slimy. He's political. He schmoozes. I love the scene like Jake's watching out the window and he sees them coming back from lunch or whatever. And like the judge has his arm around the DA and they're very clearly tight. And he doesn't even feel like he has to work that hard to win this case, but he's still putting in the time to do it. And I don't know. I just like that he's not this mustache twirling. I'm going to yeah. do whatever it takes. Like he's clearly going to take advantage of what he can take advantage of, like with the confidential list of jurors. But he's not trying to sabotage necessarily. Right. Well, and he always readily admits that what happened to Carly's daughter was horrible. Yeah. And that right, he understands right. his actions, but it's still the law is the law. Yeah. Right. 
Right. This was a much easier thing to approach than I think. Angie and I are still trying to figure out how we want to approach House of Cards when we get there, because yeah. that's mm-hmm. the last thing that Joel Schumacher's directed was for House of Cards. And it will be a couple years yeah. when we get there, so that may help, too. Well, I'm hoping to finish watching the entire series by then, but I've tried getting a few episodes deeper, and it's like the character he's playing there is so close to home to the person mm-hmm. he's alleged to be. Mm-hmm. And it's not helped yeah. by Kevin Spacey putting out videos of himself in character defending him. You know? Yeah. Wow. This is much easier. Okay, so setting all of that aside, (laughs) and I know, Mike, we're going to have a similar conversation when we get to Lex Barker. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Setting all of that aside, Kevin Spacey is a very talented actor. He plays the role well. I think the role is well Mm -hmm. written. I like that he's arrogant, but not evil. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to say. That he has aspirations, but they're not unfounded, and his arguments are not unwarranted. He's very much basically the same character Tommy Lee Jones played in The Client. Yeah. Even though he's coming from a different role. And it's like, he's political. He's very political. He has aspirations. He's grandiose. And he knows how to play a crowd. Mm -hmm. But he's, again, he's not wrong. And again, that kind of breaks down that whole nuanced argument of what is right and wrong in a situation like this, Mm -hmm. where it's like everything is a little right and everything is a little wrong. Mm -hmm. He takes that side without feeling like he's just taking an extreme because it feels like he is trying to break it down to the heart of it. But yeah, I think it's a good performance. It fits the film well. It's not as cringy to look back on. The one thing that, again, another bit of grading shorthand writing was the whole impotent joke that just came out of nowhere. nowhere. Yeah, came out of nowhere, went nowhere, and was not anywhere in the book or had anything to back it up. It was just another way to shoot down the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, that's cheap writing. Yeah. (laughs) Goldsman. (laughs) (laughs) To get to the heart of my issue with Akiva Goldsman is it's stuff like that that he does a lot. Mm -hmm. This is a film where he doesn't do that as much Mm because he already has a good source that he's adapting. But he very much falls on a lot of shortcuts that are very obvious, that are very cheap. Mm -hmm. As we were mentioning with our Batman review, it's like he's throwing in a whole ton of one-liners that don't really have anything to do with each other. And Mm -hmm. it's pointing out stuff in a story that's not even constructed. Yeah, It's nice to see him adapting material well and again some of the scenes that are added are well done but it's like moments like that just kind of like damn it (laughs) makes me wince it's quick though at least it's quick it's quick but again but the frustrating thing with goldsman is that he gets attached to properties that i really want to see a film adaptation of and then they're full of (laughs) stuff like that Mm -hmm. and it's like constantine i love the way it's directed i like the story i like the actors i like all that stuff but it's full of so many little moments like that I, Robot, very similar, full of a mm. lot of stuff in there that I like, but it has so many little moments like that, you know, and it's like, I just want to get a film out of it that doesn't have that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, that is just kind of gets to the heart of why I have my issues with Akiva Goldsman is he does a lot of cheap shortcuts. Yeah. That's my thing. So let's move to the true star of this film, Michael. Me? Yes. <laughs> oh. Yes, sorry, Michael May. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you were in there? Where were you? As background extra in restaurant scene number two. <laughs> yes, that was me. <laughs> now the real star, Patrick McGowan as Judge Noose. <laughs> so Michael, the prisoner, is now the judge. He is. He is. A, he's awesome in it. He does a pretty good southern accent. He's got a great look. I love his kind of longish hair and his little glasses. That name is a little bit on the nose. I don't know who came up with that. If that was Gisham or... <laughs> But it's also kind of awesome. As judges go in courtroom dramas, he's up there for me. See, I see him and I just see the king from Braveheart. (laughs) (laughs) That's my point. I guess because especially since he's older there. It helps that I've watched The Prisoner. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm aware of The Prisoner, but I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, I thought he did a good job. I don't have a whole lot of huge thoughts about him, but he was good. He, He was fair when he needed to be fair. He didn't just side with the DA the whole time, which was nice. Yeah. Yeah. He was cozy enough with them to make you kind of worried about it. But when it actually came down to like how he treated his courtroom, it felt like he Mm -hmm. was pretty even handed. Yeah, he was genuine. Mm -hmm. Very lovely performance. It's one of those ones where it's like you don't recognize the actor right away. Mm -hmm. And I went and looked him up. I'm like, oh, crap. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because he's doing something very different with the hair. Uh Hearing him with that accent and that voice is Mm -hmm. so different. But I thought he did it well. Mm hmm. 
basically the only major witnesses they had in this were the two opposing psychiatrists. What do you think about those sequences? That was classic courtroom drama. (laughs) I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the courtroom stuff, but the way those were executed were very well. I liked the way they both sneakily was like, oh, do you remember this? Do you remember, you know, Uh (laughs) the characters themselves. It was really weird the way that Jake brings up that, oh, yeah, by the way, that statutory rape charge is his wife. It's like still six years, (laughs) you know, but it was very good writing. I was curious. If that was even true. (laughs) Right. Yeah, Yeah. right. (laughs) He says like, what if I told you that yada, 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 yada. And I kept expecting a line later on where he goes, no, I just made that up. In the book, it was (laughs) true. And the reason why he even had charges against him is she was the daughter of the local judge. Mm, mm. Okay. Who threw that charge at him, hoping they would break up. But then they ended up getting married and then the judge dropped Mm -hmm. the charges and expunged them from the record, which is why nobody else was able to find them. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised if in Mississippi, the age of 17 is age of consent anyway. And this would have been like, say, the 40s or 50s, too. Yeah. So I don't know what the laws were back then. Then it would have been 14. (laughs) 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 Sorry. I'm I'm from the South. I can be that judgmental. (laughs) Michael, what did you think about the two psychiatrists? I mean, I always love Emmett Walsh. Yeah. He's one of my favorites. And I know I know that other actor from something and I didn't look him up and don't remember. Yeah, he's a character who does a ton of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah, pretty much like what Angie was saying. It get a gotcha moment with both of them, which is what you expect and want out of those kinds of scenes. And they were different enough that mm-hmm. it didn't feel like it was repeating itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they, they were fun. And I, I like how they both are relying on their psychiatrist for the insanity case and they both get torn down. Right, right. <laughs> And then, Michael, what would you think about Looney, the deputy who lost the leg? Oh, man. I'm a big, (laughs) big fan of Chris Cooper anyway. That you turn him loose, uh, it's another part that just rips me up. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful and emotional. I forget exactly where this movie falls in Chris Cooper's career, but that guy could almost do no wrong for me as an actor. Ditto. Chris Cooper is great in just about everything I've seen him in. And yeah, he does really good here. You know, I liked especially the way he turns away from Carl Lee in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You really don't know what he's going to say up there. Right. He could take it personally. He could take it not. Obviously, his family feels a little bit differently. But the way that he does do it and the way he acts it is just fantastic. I know like just a few years after this was when he did American Beauty, which again, another fantastic Mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had been acting, did a lot of like small roles in TV and movies going back to the 80s. I was about to say, he was probably in Lonesome Dove before this. That was before this. Yeah. Yeah. And then after this, it was like The Horse Whisperer, October Sky, The Patriot. But yeah, he got the Oscar for American Beauty. Sure, that makes sense. No, yeah, it's a wonderful performance, wonderfully cast. I like his character in terms of that further complicates things. Because it's not Mm -hmm. just that he shot down the people who did this to his daughter, but he ended up blowing the leg off of a completely innocent man. Right. Right. Whom he knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did like the scene where Ozzy the sheriff actually takes him to the hospital so he can apologize to the man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And another great performance by Samuel L. Jackson in that scene, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. So that's one that comes straight from the books, too, where I like how we can get into the sheriff here, Ozzy. What I like about the sheriff is you know where his sympathies lie, and, and he does play kind of mm-hmm. loose with... Like, in the book, he lets Carl chill out in his personal office with, like, a shower and everything <laughs> like that most of the time. Mm-hmm. He'll drive Carl places. There's a funny bit in the book that was also in the script where in order to get all this mass media away from Carl while they're trying to transport him because they're worried about safety reasons, they just dress up a fake actor as Carl Lee and then they lead him out and then suddenly the guy breaks his cuffs and runs away and then all the reporters go and chase (laughs) after that guy. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. That's great. (laughs) That makes me like Ozzy even more. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Charles Dutton was, God, one of the great character actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I think he was really nice in what they did for his character here. You certainly feel for that character. And yeah, he plays it very well. I mean, just being the sheriff in that town and the racial divide and he's doing the best he can. But, you know, he's also so happy at the end when he gets to arrest them all. (laughs) It's a really good character. Yeah. And I love the button at the end, too, where he knows that his deputy (laughs) is is one of the bad Mm -hmm. guys and they just kind of tie that loose end up dutton is a great actor and just has a lot of cool presence about him he portrays in very few lines of dialogue the tension you're talking about noel of just being a black sheriff in that community and Mm -hmm. he has to do a lot with looks on his face about how he's feeling about situations that he's encountering well what i like is he's a fighter he's someone Mm -hmm. who obviously had to fight to get that position and win the respect of people and i like that yeah he was a former star quarterback 
And then, yeah, he's not afraid to pull out the baton and beat the crap out of people. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, especially when the one guy who tried to blow up Jake's house and he's mm-hmm. like, oh, you yeah. would need to open this and defuse this. And he starts breaking the guy's leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is kind of a personal question for both of you, but you, you both mentioned being from the South. How do you feel this represents the tensions and the attitudes of the South? Sadly, too well, I think. <laughs> I grew up in North Florida. People here, I was in Florida, go, that's not really the South, but the Panhandle is very much like I grew up about 20 minutes from the Georgia line. Mm. There are regions of the South that are more like this than others. And I have family in Mississippi where this takes place and is very much a heightened thing in Mississippi still to this day. Mm. So, yeah, these attitudes were not attitudes that I encountered every day of my life, but certainly I did encounter them. (laughs) So (laughs) it's hard because I have a lot of love for the South and there's a lot of positive Mm -hmm. things about the South. This is a really big, ugly spot. And one of the cool things about the film is it doesn't vilify the whole region. It's nuanced. This thing. Like, yeah, yeah, like there yeah. is this big, big problem that needs to be dealt with. It needs to be discussed and figured out. But there's also a lot of good. There's a lot of family. There's a lot of community. There's a lot of joy and love. I like that that's all here. I do pretty much agree. In some ways, I do wish... And I mean, I guess we do sort of, we never really obviously learn too much about who Mickey Mouse is yeah, mm-hmm. and why he's doing what he does. But I do like that there is a guy who obviously got thrown into it because he was in that group of people and it was peer pressure, but then also obviously really regrets what he's doing. My fear watching this and thinking of some of the people I know and that I've encountered in my life is that sometimes the Ku Klux Klan looks a little too mustache twirling villain and a little too over the top. And then they see the NAACP come in and they go, oh, yeah, it's just like that. And it's like, okay, guys, but like, (laughs) it's not all about justifying your opinion and making you think, well, I'm not as bad as them. So it's not, you know what I mean? Like, I worry sometimes that not everybody's going to get the full message. I hope that last scene of we're not friends drives it home and Mm -hmm. gives you that moment. And I think you can tell that Grisham grew up in the South and worked in the South and he's Mm -hmm. representing all of those ideas. I think someone from the North may not have been able to write the same kind of story and given it as much nuance as he did. So, yeah, I think overall it is pretty accurate. It's one of those things where even in the book, whenever white people are together, even if they're the people who are on the side of Carl E., they'll just casually throw around the N-word, mm-hmm. you know, even Jake. Yeah. It's something that they just don't even think about until the mm-hmm. events of the book force them to start looking at it. Yeah. Kind of like Hawk Finn. He just starts out the book casually, just that's what you call people. That's how mm-hmm. you refer to people. And then as he starts to learn more and more about this person that he's with and how the world is treating that person, it's like suddenly questioning his own views. And I like that this is ultimately a story about putting up a mirror. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Getting this whole group of white people to realize that, yes, you're thinking about these people differently just because they're black. Mm-hmm. Take a moment, picture this entire thing. Now imagine they're white. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought it did a good job of contrasting the politics between, you know, Rourke and Jake. Like, especially that whole scene where mm-hmm. they're arguing about the death penalty. Yeah. But what's interesting is Grisham is himself a guard carry member of the ACLU and like a staunch anti-death penalty guy. Mm. So it was interesting to see him giving that voice to Jake of opposition. Mm-hmm. I do agree the KKK is a little... It's hard not to be over the top when you're dealing with the game, I know. You know. I'm not saying they should be yeah. sympathetic. Please don't take that. Because they're dangerously absurd buffoons. Right, right. <laughs> Especially that opening scene. Yeah. If you put the ACLU out on the street with them, as Mm -hmm. deep as we get into the ACLU in this movie, they're kind of using a lot of similar tactics. Right. That could be a danger if you Mm -hmm. just say, well, that's the opposite side of the KKK. Well, okay, there's really a lot more differences than just their politics, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. There's also the public media game, and then there's the targeted harassment. Mm -hmm. The burning crosses, the angry phone calls, and all that stuff. Yeah. I do like even on this side with the NAACP that they get into the whole misappropriation of funds and money. Sure. They're coming in for a genuine cause and a genuine case, but they're also using that to kind of line their pockets. Mm -hmm. I like that there's, again, a little bit of nuance there without fully vilifying them. Mm -hmm. I like with the KKK, the nuance isn't in, well, let's see things from their point of view. No, it's never that. I like, though, the character of, again, Mickey Mouse, of the person who, Mm -hmm. these are his people, these are his friends, you know, he's a white guy in the South who grew up with all these beliefs, but actually seeing it in action and seeing the actual violence and the cruelty and all that stuff is, this is too much. Yeah. I like that kind of background character that they build with him. 
And what's interesting is the character of the sheriff's deputy who falls in with that group too is not only not in the book, but not in the script. So it's like, that's a character that I think they just kind of built into the story mm-hmm. as they were filming it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, the whole scene where they bust Cobb and the the deputy and all that stuff in the end Mm -hmm. wasn't even in the script. Yeah, Yeah. okay. So that might have been something that Joel just laid in as they went along. What about when the cops pull over Ellen and grab her? Uh, In the book, it was just clans members who just had the lights. What about in the script? It was just clans members who had the lights. Okay. Okay. They just used the lights and pulled her over and then grabbed her out of the car. Hmm. Every time I saw him, I just kept thinking of Rage Against the Machine in my head. The song, Some of Those Who Work Forces Also Burn Crosses. <laughs> it's like, yep, it's true. Yep. Oh, yeah, we've known that, especially in recent years, where it's like, yeah. hey, let's look at all these tattoos that these cops have and actually trace their origins. Mm-hmm. Why does that cop have that certain pin on his jacket? Yeah. Oh, yeah. These are not issues that have gone away in the 20 years since this film. Sadly, no. But then the other thing about Mickey Mouse is that in both the book and the script, one of the last scenes is him being tied to a post and set on fire. Oh my goodness. By the clan who find out that he betrayed them. Wow. I kind of like the idea that no, he's still out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That he took this choice to turn on them because I would like to know that there's someone who's of that mindset who's questioning the people that he's with who's still out there and may continue to grow. Mm-hmm. It's a hopeful sign. I kind of like that they cut that out. Yeah. And then on the other side, you get like Kiefer Sutherland as the brother of one of the slain guys. Great performance, but again, his little mustache twirly of, your brother mm-hmm. and that other guy, they were good boys. It's like, no, they weren't. <laughs> no, they yeah. weren't. They were terrible. <laughs> they were terrible human beings, you know? <laughs> yep. But that's how it would have been seen by the yeah. people of that town, so yeah, right. it makes sense. Right. And I love that one of the two guys from the opening is played by the weird actor who was in the X-File, Doug Hutchinson, where he was that character in the X-File who would, like, burrow into people's walls and, like, eat their livers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't remember that episode. Yeah, he, he's one of those characters who just plays a lot of very weird roles. Like, he's Looney Ben Jim in Punisher Warzone. I definitely recognized him. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what movie, though. Not that. Obviously not X-Files. He's very prolific, but it's all in just these little weird roles. He was on Lost, I'm seeing. Yeah. So that's part of it. Okay. I even like the whole scene where him and the sheriff, it's like, you know, I voted for you, and I don't have a problem with a black person who used to be on TV being the sheriff. No offense. And see, once again... Again, that's so Southern justification. It's so yeah. ingrained, yeah. I've got a black friend, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. and it wasn't that he voted for it, my mom voted, my mom for, right. voted for it. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with it, yeah. mm-hmm. so that makes me enlightened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're a black person, you can't help it. That mindset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The whole scene of the opposing protesters, the black protesters and the Klansmen just erupting into violence. Michael, what did you think about that sequence? I spent a lot of time reading their signs, which I thought were pretty interesting. (laughs) Just seeing how they were like playing off of each other. This side has this side and this side kind of mocks it by like changing one word or making it sound similar. Mm -hmm. I love the van that's selling t-shirts that both say Free Carly and Fry Carly. Oh, I didn't notice the Fry Carly ones. No, I didn't see that. Out of the same van? Yeah. The same van had white shirts that say Free and black shirts that say Fry. Oh my, I totally missed that. Why would you purchase that then? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That seems a little bit hard to believe actually that they were making yeah. any money that day. <laughs> I think that whole sequence impressed me most just from a filmmaking standpoint. Like a lot of the wide shots, kind of the high angles and, you know, getting those crowds to mm-hmm. cooperate and do what they needed to do to make that effective on film was pretty impressive. I guess the main thing is it hits a little close to home with a lot of stuff that's still happening today. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was a little rough from that perspective, but well shot and well executed. This is another film where I would hold up as like Joel is a good director and he's a strong director. Mm -hmm. He builds a world. He builds an atmosphere. He builds a mood. He is really great at letting actors play and just shoot for it. And when he's anchored by a really good story, he really fleshes it out beautifully. And I think a lot of the mood and tension that, again, that we had in both Flatliners and Falling Down are perfectly exemplified here as well. Yeah, not only that sequence of showing this kind of broader world opposition as these two sides just erupt into violence, even just the whole, yeah, maybe it's starting to get a little extreme when you're throwing Molotov cocktails off the roof, but boy, do you not feel bad about the person who gets hit by one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. Red Foreman. Bye-bye. Yeah. (laughs) Kirkwood Smith. I love that actor, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, Who better to play as a snarly, (laughs) mustache-twirling Klansman leader as Kirkwood Smith? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he gets killed and it all gets worse. (laughs) In the book, what's funny is it's like a firebomb that comes out of the window of the courthouse and they 
subtly hint that it was Ozzy who threw it. Oh, really? Okay. But yeah, no, I like the way that scene is played out. Again, like the whole opening scene with the actual abduction and attack. Mm. Again, the heat of it. Mm. You can feel how heavy and hot the air is. The very abstract ways in which it's portraying the scene without graphically showing mm-hmm. you what's happening. Right, right, right. Even just the whole shots of the two guys just kind of driving into this neighborhood and going up into the store and just holding the camera on all the black people who are just staring at them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their apprehension in their faces. They're just like, just go away. Yeah. yeah. They don't want to start nothing, but they don't want anything started either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it immediately sets up the power dynamics. Yep. Even if you didn't know what this part of the world is like, you would get the feeling just mm-hmm. from that one little scene. Exactly. And it's like, yeah. they're grossly outnumbered. It wouldn't take much to set this off and make it all go very bad for them. Mm-hmm. It's very coiled. Mm-hmm. 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 Again, I think Joel directs it beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much of this film that I think is great. And even just on a production design standpoint, I love all the murals inside the courtroom. Like, there's this gigantic mural of, like, justice and all that stuff behind the judge. Mm. Oh, I didn't notice those. Me either. Oh, yeah. Take a look at the background design next time you watch it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's going full flatliners with some of that production design. (laughs) But it's not, like, leaping out, like, black light in your face, like in some of his other films. Yeah, obviously not. Yeah. But it's like, if you take a look at it, it's like, no, Joel is putting just as much into the visual aesthetic of this movie as he does any of his other stuff. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's always nice when you have the film where it's kind of grounded by the reality of the story and it's not as opulent and operatic as Joel can get. Mm -hmm. Not to say that that's bad because, again, Flatliners was great. Angie, did you have any thoughts about Joel's direction on the movie? No, I mean, pretty much what you said. The colors are like all these browns and reds and gold to really drive home that heat. And yeah, I don't have any specific other thoughts, but it's just really well executed. I think Mm -hmm. it really fits the style of the film very well. Mm -hmm. Nothing really new. I would just underline what you're saying about the world building and how much like the South this really feels. Mm -hmm. The way he shoots the courthouse and he shoots it from far enough away that you can kind of see like some of the surrounding buildings and it feels like a real community that this is taking place in. You have actually what suddenly comes to mind, Angie, is Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. A little bit, yeah. Or again, Joel, he's a white gay guy from New York, Mm -hmm. but we've seen examples of where he's able to go and explore and build the world of these communities in other places. Like again, Mm -hmm. Car Wash, DC Cab, Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, this, rich white people and cousins. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) When he really sits down and he puts his work into building the world of the characters, it's like everything else just comes naturally out of it. Yeah. We've run into issues where like Dying Young, where it's like the film just kind of jarly moves locations. He never gets to settle into a world or 2000 Malibu Road, where it's just no. Yeah, no. <laughs> but it's nice to see that because this was a period where I was starting to get worried about Joel. I know he was having mm. drinking problems. I know he was having issues with his films not always going through the best pre-production period. But this is a good sign that no, man, he's still got it. Yeah. As we move beyond Batman and Robin, we're going to get a lot more thrillers, a lot more dramas. I'm going to be curious to see how many more of them are like, let's absorb ourselves into this world Mm -hmm. that these characters are surrounded by. Because I I think that's when he's at his best, when he's doing a bigger story that has this kind of centralized theme. Now you got me thinking about 8mm, so yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be very curious to revisit that one. (laughs) That one's intense. But I mean, even Phone Booth, where it's the entire world around the phone booth. Yeah. Flawless, you know, a conservative handicapped man finds himself in the gay community. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of these films I have not even seen before, so I'm very curious to see that angle. Trying to think if there's anything else to bring up. I love the score. I can't even think of a single note right now. Yeah, I'm sure it's very effective at conveying the mood. (laughs) It's very enveloped in the movie, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it is. But there's not like a John Williams theme that kind of stands out or anything. The only thing that was a little over the top was the whole him doing his big speech, cut to outside the courtroom as the doors fly open, and giant trumpet fanfare. Mm. (laughs) You know, as they're announcing he's innocent. It was a little grandiose there, but for the most part, yeah, it does a good job with like a lot of the Southern choir music. It's very moody. Mm. Again, it's very sad. It's very sad music. And this was Elliot Goldenthal, who sure. this is his second film with Joel after having done Batman Forever. Very different. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that it shows that range of Goldenthal, because I thought yeah. his score was one of the best things about Batman Forever. Mm. Oh, 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 hang on. Mm. One person I forgot to mention, <laughs> Oliver Platt. I'm so glad I was going to have to bring him up if he didn't. <laughs> Oliver Platt. <laughs> Angie, what'd you think of Oliver Platt? I was very excited to see him again after Flatliners. 
I didn't realize he was in this movie. I forgot he was in there. And yeah, he's just fun. Anytime you see him, he's playing the unapologetic asshole and he's doing a good job of it. You know, what can you say? He's still a lovable unapologetic asshole. Yes. You're asking the wrong question. <laughs> you need to be asking, what would Harry Rex do? Yeah. Cheat like crazy. <laughs> I love Oliver Platt. And this and Porthos in The Three Musketeers from 93, yeah. like my two mm. favorite Oliver Platt roles. Like he just shines and oozes good stuff all over it. Dude, like Platt. That's true. That's uh, another really good one. But <laughs> this and Three Musketeers are my top for him. Yeah. yeah, he's so good in a lot of things. You know, Flatliners being another one. I always love him. Harry Rex. Just the name. Mm-hmm. Harry Rex is pretty great. As far as like the comedic relief, he's mm-hmm. a very valuable part of this whole process. <laughs> That he takes it seriously, like he gets the stakes of what's going on here, but he can't help approaching it the way that he approaches it. And it just adds lovely flavor to the whole thing. Mm. My one place he doesn't really get to do much, because the entire reason he was brought in in the novel was to break down the jury. Mm. Okay. To break down who's who on the jury in terms of trying to assemble a good one. Mm-hmm. He does kind of stick around in the novel. He is Jake's best friend. So he's always kind of there with a supportive arm on his shoulder. And again, yeah. he's very witty and funny. And in terms of that, yeah, he's a great addition to the film. I wish he was a little more ingrained in the story, but as a presence, he's a very welcome one, and I really enjoy him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I get the sense in the movie that, that is his role. Like, that's why Jake needs him as part of the team. Like, even if he's not out doing a lot of the legwork and even coming up with the solutions, he's yeah. there to support Jake. Especially before Jake trusts Roark. Like, he feels very mm-hmm. alone yeah. in all of this. Yeah. Harry Rex is like the one person you can kind of count on. I love his hair. Yeah. <laughs> His hair is amazing. Those sideburns are awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the chops. <laughs> I mean, I just want a t shirt that says Oliver Platt is my life goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad one. Not a bad one at all. <laughs> and then just getting into some of the supporting players. The actress who played the secretary. Yeah. Mm. Brenda Fricker. Yep. Pigeon Lady. Yeah. Pigeon Lady from Home Alone 2. Oh, okay. I knew she looked familiar. <laughs> who, it wasn't the Razzies, but another one nominated her for Worst Actress of the Year for this role. What? Yeah. Oh, that's not good. That's not fair. Yeah, I yeah. thought she was good. I really like that scene where she's saying that her and Lucian never, ever did anything. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, she totally did. <laughs> yeah. That one kind of grated on me because it was another shorthand on what was a more complicated relationship in the book. Sure. Mm. I did like the bit where... She's like, I know you didn't mean for this to happen, but it still happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole goodbye. She's not forgiving him, but she doesn't hate him. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. nuanced like the rest of the movie. Yeah. I thought it was a very good performance. And then Donald Sutherland is Lucian. Mm. I'm just going to say it. Anytime him and Kiefer are in the same movie and they're not related, it is distracting (laughs) to me. It is, yeah. (laughs) They're very much lookalike. I mean, they're both fantastic actors. Lucian was a bit of a playboy. He got around. You never know. Maybe they are related. (laughs) Maybe so. That would be such a twist for the third act. Lucian and Cora May, man. (laughs) The town's secret. Nobody talks about it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. One thing I will say that was taken out of the book was there was so much alcohol in the book. Well, yeah, it's the South. <laughs> like, Lucian was involved in all of the planning. All of, the whole thing about him, it's like, I'll never step in a courtroom again, was, mm. again, more bullshit added by Akiva. That was never oh, in the book. Okay. He was in the courtroom supporting him all the time. Yeah. Just to have that little moment at the end when he does step in. Yeah, yeah and I'm like, that's cheap. Yeah. I get it, but it's cheaply played. Mm-hmm. I think it's a fun performance, but again, his character doesn't really get to do much. No. I think with his boozing in the book, like, Jake is going through, like, 12 packs of beers every day. You know, like, they're all getting together for their meetings and are just getting hammered every single night. And are, like, all just, like, waking up on the couches every single day and starting to drink again by noon. It's like, this entire team is just going through so much alcohol in the book. It is (laughs) ridiculous. Like, to the point where it's almost distractingly absurd. <laughs> like, the whole scene where it's like, Lucius is like, I respect all your rights, now you go buy the beer. It's like, in the book, she went and got the beer. And it's like, they're going through, like, 30 <laughs> packs of beer every day. Wow. Well, you know, when it's that hot, a cold, refreshing beer can be amazing. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> So is water. (laughs) Not in the same way, man. Not in the same way. (laughs) I know I'm not a drinker, so I'm coming at it from a very different perspective. But it's like in that book, they go through so much alcohol. It is so much. 
and his character was more about he was kind of a sleazy attorney and he's almost the devil on Jake's shoulder hmm. Hmm. who's kind of pulling him to like try to exploit things again like hey I got this completely boozed up psychiatrist who will say anything we want him to say if we just keep him liquored up hmm. Jake was more the one who was like trying to focus on no let's do what's right what's true and all that stuff that's interesting yeah and so they were almost kind of an opposition even though he's a mentor figure yeah, yeah. he's the guy he's Jake's past he's what Jake needs to evolve from in order to get to where he needs to go. Right. It's interesting that he was a loving mentor and they never really even comment on the fact in the novel that he was the do whatever it takes to win even if you have to cheat. Okay. Viewpoint. So it's like they kind of tipped that and gave it to the Oliver Platt character but Mm -hmm. again it's like the only time they really play on that with the Oliver Platt character is then Sandra Bullock's breaking into an office to rifle through notes in a scene I didn't really enjoy. Right. Yeah. The script is littered with little bits that I don't like but again it's like full of stuff that I really enjoy. Mm. He was interesting but he was not really a necessary character. He didn't really do anything story wise. I think that's true. Yeah. Could have made the film about five minutes shorter. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's such an enjoyable presence for me, though. Like, oh, I always yeah. love Donald yeah. Sutherland. But that particular character that he's playing is so old-fashioned Southern gentleman. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. a joy to watch that kind of character. Well, yeah. And in the books, he lives on an old plantation house. And he has a black servant who he's literally slapping on the ass every time she goes by. Oh, goodness. Hey. So it's like that character. Not so good. Where it's like he prides himself on being, like, one of the first card-carrying members of the NAACP and the ACLU. But it's more that he used them for his own game. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm glad they kind of reinvented him a little bit then. Yeah. Me too. Well, and then that's what led to the protest that ultimately got him disbarred. He's a very complicated character, but I don't think this film had enough room to really explore the complications that made the character worthwhile to explore. Mm -hmm. I would have just cut him. Yeah. In terms of like having an older mentor figure, you already get that with the secretary who's always there looking over his shoulder and then ultimately leaves him with the code of, I don't hate you, but you hurt me Mm. and I'm leaving. Yeah. You ultimately get more from her than you get from the Luchin character. I agree with that. Yeah. Michael, anything else you want to bring up? I just want to talk briefly about Ashley Judd. Yeah. Mm. Specifically, Carla and Jake's relationship. It feels really real to me. And I love that she's never made a bad guy. Her concerns are valid concerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he admits like he is not fully thinking through all of his actions in the early part of the film. And so she's there with her daughter to show him that there are consequences to these actions. But I love when she shows up at the end. And I love some of the conversations about her even when she's not there. But when she shows up at the end, it just it's a different kind of marriage than I'm often used to seeing, especially during this time period. She really loves him. They love each other. They're going to stay faithful to each other. They support each other, even though everything is not okay. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that was kind of weird, she's like, I had to come. And he's like, in the middle of the storm. And I was almost like, is this a dream sequence? <laughs> it did feel a little bit like Is he that. making this up to like feel better about what he's doing right now? Like, what's going on there? That's a little odd. But otherwise, it was a really good moment. <laughs> In the book, that scene wasn't in there. Okay. The whole end scene at the picnic, too, wasn't in the book. That was all stuff that was added. In the mm-hmm. book, it's like he doesn't even tell her that their house has been burned down. And when she finally comes back home and discovers it, it's like it almost leads to a divorce because he just didn't tell her. Well, yeah, that would be justified. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Jake is a very broken man by the end of the book. Mm-hmm. He's won this case. But one of the other big points is also about just how much he's lost in the choice that he made to take it on. Mm. He never got the money that was raised by the NAACP. They took that money and left. Mm. Mm. He never got paid for the case more than the $900, half of which he had to give back to Carly's family just in order to help support them. Mm. He's kind of become a bit of a public pariah where it's like some people want high profile cases that just aren't arguable. And other people are just like, well, he argued that case that tore this town apart. Mm. I would love to read it. There was actually a secret sequel novel that takes place three years later that came out in 2013. Oh, okay. That was kind of exploring that and also, again, another very racially charged case involving a millionaire oh. who disinherits his children and leaves everything that he owns to his black servant. Hmm. And it gets into this whole battle of the will and what was his mindset when he wrote it and all that stuff and gets into this very legally charged thing while also picking up what's Jake Bergantz's life like three years after this gigantic national case. Okay. Sycamore Row, I think it's called. Yeah. Nice. Angie, any other thoughts you want to bring up? This may seem an odd aside, but following Joel's work, I'm really surprised Kimberly Scott was not in this movie. I know, right? He's given her so many little small roles. She must have been busy, because I know she was certainly acting and doing other things around this time. But, you know, when you've got a good section of a black community here, you've got a perfect place to put her in. So I'm kind of surprised he didn't. I know, right? I like the actress who played his wife, but that would have been a good role for Kimberly Scott. Like, I love the Mm -hmm. whole scene with Carly and his wife, where they're talking Mm -hmm. about 
in the jail yeah. about how's the money doing, how's her daughter doing, and it's like she's trying to put on a smile for him, but it's like she doesn't have any good news. Yeah. That's a really good heartbreaking scene, and yeah, it is surprising because Kimberly Scott, yeah, from Flatliners on, she's been in pretty much mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. I don't think she was in Dying Young, was she? But she's been in 2000 Malibu Road. She was in Falling Down. Right. I believe she was in The Client. She was in Batman Forever. Yeah. I'll have to look up to see if she's going to be in anything more afterwards. But that was kind of a nice little run of she was always this kind of reliable little character after it would pop up. Because mm-hmm. that's always been one of the interesting contrasts between John Carpenter, who I've done the past show on Joel, is John would reuse actors and crew all the time, whereas Joel just kind of always bounces around and doesn't really have a mm-hmm. set team that he works with. Right. And I think she was probably the most recurring actor. Mm-hmm. And yeah, in a film where you could have easily found some great roles for her. <laughs> right. By the way, did anyone notice Octavia Spencer? <laughs> I was just going to bring her up. She's Roark's nurse yeah. at the very end. Oh, yeah, yeah. That this was her pre-fame cameo. <laughs> trying to think of if there's anything else to bring up about the film. Yeah, not really. I mean, I would love to talk about Kiefer Sutherland at length, but I don't think there's a lot to this character in particular. No, there really isn't. I'm just a fan of his work in general, but not one of my favorite roles of his. There was kind of a cut bit where after meeting with the Kiefer character, the Kurtwood Smith is talking to his own crew and he's like, yeah, these boys are just a bunch of idiots, but we can use them. And then he ends up getting killed, and then Kiefer ends up taking over the entire thing. Yeah. I thought it was a bit too much having him be the sniper who almost shot Jake. Mm. One of the great things Mm -hmm. about the book is you don't know who's doing these things. It is a lot of anonymity. You have the firebomb that takes out the KKK member. We never know who threw it. We never know who Mm -hmm. takes that shot. We never know who specifically, you know, are the ones who attack Rourke. We never know specifically who are the ones who attack anybody. Mickey Mouse is the only one who's really characterized, and that ultimately leads to him being the one who's killed. Yeah. The KKK is definitely playing on their ability to just disappear into the crowd. Well, then the focus becomes more on this is what this community is experiencing, yeah. not right. so much here's this group of sure. bad guys. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Whenever they disappear into the pool of literally the white populace, you never know who among the white populace is the one and who isn't. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. I don't think the film made a bad choice of characterizing them to make them more recognizable. It's just it's a different choice. Yeah. Yeah. Final thoughts. I thought this was a really well-made film. I think it's one of Joel's stronger films. I think Akiva Goldsman did an okay job. Mm -hmm. It's a strong story. It's well-played. It's well-directed. Great actors, great cast. I think it's a really nice film to have had between the Batman films. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Even if it ultimately, in history, kind of got overshadowed by them. But I think it should have been a great reminder to the populace that, nah, Joel could still do some great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michael, any final thoughts? It's such a strong, well-made film and and well-acted and all of it. It's so thought-provoking, so challenging in all the right ways. I think that's why I keep coming back to it. I just watch it over and over and over again. Angie, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, pretty much agreeing with everything y'all said. Yeah. (laughs) All right, well, let's get into the box office and release. This film came out July 24th. It was a Wednesday release. Hmm. Already playing in theaters, this was the July that Independence Day had come out. Okay. It had already been in theaters four weeks at the time. Also in theaters were Phenomena, Courage Under Fire, The Nutty Professor, Multiplicity, (laughs) and Kazam. Wow. (laughs) And also opening that week at Number five, Kingpin. Remember the bowling comedy by the Fairly oh, Brothers? I, oh, yeah. I certainly do. Jackie Chan's Super Cop opened at number six. <laughs> and at number 15 was the MTV film Joe's Apartment. Oh, boy. Man. I think I actually went and saw that in the theater, too. Remember that brief flash in the pan when Joe's Apartment was a pop culture thing and died before yeah. the movie came out? <laughs> a Time to Kill opened at number one. Total weekend gross was $19 million, which so it wasn't huge. But given that it was the first film to bump Independence Day out of the number one slot after Independence Day had already made $223 million. Hmm. (laughs) It had its time. (laughs) Oh, yeah. In its second week, A Time to Kill is still number one. So it's still Mm -hmm. doing fine. It only dropped 10% in its revenue. Mm -hmm. So it's still doing well. Opening at number three was Matilda. Okay. And opening at number two was Chain Reaction. Remember that Keanu thriller? Yes. Isn't that Keanu and Rachel Weisz? I think so. And I want to say Morgan Freeman's in it as well. It's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah. So in its third week of release... Oh, boy, talking about John Carpenter, opening at number three was Escape from L.A. (laughs) Oh, wow. Oh, boy. A Time to Kill finally dropped to number two, because opening at number one was Jack. 
the Robin Williams, Francis Ford Coppola movie about the child who ages quickly. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Remember, that was briefly number one. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to say it's probably going to drop next week, right? I don't know. Yeah, let's <laughs> check. Not. In its fourth week, A Time to Kill is dropped to number three. Jack is still at number two, oddly. Okay. Also opening it that week at number nine, you had Tales from the Crypt Bordello of Blood. <laughs> And opening at number four was The Fan. Remember that one? The Robert De Niro oh, obsessed wow, yeah. fan thriller? Yeah, yeah. And then opening at number one was Tin Cup. Tin Cup. Wasn't that Kevin Costner, the golf movie? Yeah, yeah, golf movie. Okay. And its fifth week of release, A Time to Kill is still at number four in the box office, so it's still doing just fine. Mm -hmm. Opening at number one was the Mario Van Peebles film Solo. Oh my gosh. So many <laughs> comic books advertise Solo. Wow. I can't believe that was ever number one. That no, is crazy. And number nine. Number nine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> that, that makes me feel much better about the world. <laughs> Opening at number three was a very Brady sequel. Okay. okay. And opening at number one, surprisingly, given its bomb reputation, is The Island of Dr. Moreau. Uh. Oh, okay. Probably dropped pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, not a good movie, but I can see why people, I'm sure yeah. I saw it opening weekend. In its sixth week of release, I'm going to keep going until we drop out of the top ten. A Time to Kill is okay. still holding at number four. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's doing fine. It already cracked 90 million at this point, so it's doing really well. <laughs> Opening at number three is First Kid. I don't remember that one. First Kid? No. It's about the son of the president or something like that, right? That's what I would assume oh. from the title, but I don't remember that one. Oh, is that the one where Sinbad is his bodyguard? Oh, that might be. That oh, might be. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. I saw that in theaters. Island of Dr. Moreau dropped from number one to number five very quickly. <laughs> yeah, man, Escape from L.A. has already dropped out of the top ten. Opening at number one is The Crow City of Angels. Mm. Okay, so that's the second one. Yeah. So we're having a whole yeah. run of films that I'm surprised actually open at number one. <laughs> In its seventh week, A Time to Kill is still number four. <laughs> Wow, it's great. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, and nothing else really major opened except for Bulletproof, which opened at number one. I don't remember Bulletproof. I'm assuming it was a generic action movie. It sounds like it. In its eighth week of release, it's like we're already into September here. A Time to Kill has finally dropped to number seven. Okay. Opening at number 12 was Feeling Minnesota, which wasn't counting on that one. It sounds really familiar, so probably. Opening at number two was Fly Away Home. And opening at number one was Maximum Risk. Wow. Again, another generic 90s action movie. I was about to say, yeah. Seagal, Van Damme. It's, yeah, it's got to be one <laughs> or the other. So Bulletproof was Damon Wayans and Adam Sandler. Oh. Oh, yeah. I kind of vaguely remember that one. Fly Away Home was the Anna Pack one, one with the geese. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, Maximum Risk, as predicted, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Oh, that's the there one with go. Natasha Henstridge in it, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So in its ninth week of release, Time to Kill is still in the top ten at number eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dropped. Last Man Standing, the Bruce Willis, Walter Hill remake of Yojimbo, opened at number two. Okay. And then opening at number one was The First Wives Club. Okay. Yeah, I kind of remember that. Wasn't that like Goldie Hawn, Bette Midler, all that stuff? I want to say so, yeah. I think so, yeah. In its tenth week of release, A Time to Kill has finally dropped to number 11, so we'll drop it there. Okay. So far, has pulled in $104 million hmm. against a budget of, I want to say, 40 Okay. Yeah. That is when Two Days in the Valley opened at number four. Don't remember that one. Mm -mm. And beating out maximum risk is Extreme Measures. <laughs> <laughs> they really do how to name them in the uh, yeah. 90s, didn't they? 90s action films. I'm seeing Gene Hackman in the poster. And Hugh Grant. And Hugh Grant. Hmm. Hugh okay. Grant in Extreme Dream Measures. measures. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, A Time to Kill was a hit. Very comparable to Flatliners. It ultimately did $152 million worldwide. Overseas, it didn't do too huge. It did $43 million. It did 106 mm. here in the U.S. Apparently, the film was very heavily controversial in France, huh. where it became the centerpiece of large political protests. France had this period where it became like staunchly anti-death penalty, and they felt that this was a film that was arguing in favor of death penalty and vigilantism. Hmm. Okay. I think it's definitely a film that explores the nuance of vigilantism. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily supporting it because it's still exploring that there are consequences that come out of it. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that coda at the end with the big picnic, it's still a little too much. Like he got away completely scot-free. Mm -hmm. There still should have been some level of consequence to it. 
Well, you know that the Ku Klux Klan side of things is not going to just give yeah. up after this. Yeah. His life is going to be miserable. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the story doesn't really end there. Either end it on a slightly more ambiguous note or explore more that now stuff is still going to come out of this. Because mm -hmm. he's now a very public figure on all right. sides of this issue. I think it was more in France. It just became the centerpiece of a lot of groups who very heavily publicized it, kind of as a way to so. kind of champion their own whatever argument. Mm -hmm. Again, like how like people were using Carly Haley in the movie itself. Yeah, I definitely don't think it's pro-death penalty. I don't think you could say that at all. No. Mm -mm. Again, I like the whole argument that Jake and Rourke are having. It's like, oh, yeah, I think you absolutely should have the death penalty. It should be used more. And she's like, well, have you ever actually sat down and watched someone be executed? Mm -hmm. She had. He hadn't. Right. It's an argument where there's no real answer on on either side. It's they're presenting their cases. Yeah, nobody wins mm -hmm. that argument. Exactly. Right. It's something that doesn't have any easy answers. It's kind of a shame that it was publicized like that, and I'm wondering if that affected its wider release overseas. It is a very American story, so I'm Absolutely, wondering if it also yeah. just had limited appeal overseas. Mm -hmm. Could mm -hmm. be. I remember France had, in the Cousins version, had people wearing Ku Klux Klan costumes oh, yes. like it was just a funny little joke, so they yeah. really don't get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, France. We did not enjoy Cousin Cuisine. No. But you can hear more about that on our episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, guys. I'm a fan. No, this is about everything you do. Angie, it's nice to meet you. You too. You know, I'm a fan of Joel Schumacher, so this is really fun. Yeah, I'm glad we were <laughs> able to have you on for it. Agreed. And I think, Angie, that's going to wrap our episode up. Yep. Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs>